two dimension Dirac like plane. So uh, now what we're going to see is uh, the application of of uh, uh, this of the results that we obtained in the last lecture. And it is uh, uh, there are three significant, like I said earlier, there are three significant uh, uh, observes to be drawn and remembered from the first lecture. Firstly, that uh, these uh, particles known as Dirac fermions are uh, massless and they obey the two dimensional massless uh, Dirac gradient. And thirdly, that they have this uh, important property that they are also eigenfunctions of the chirality operator. So they are, uh, they have these chiral eigenstates. And uh, now in this lecture, we are going to see what are the implications uh, as far as transport is of these things in, uh, in terms of uh, transport. So, uh, this is Andre, I mean, I mentioned uh, Gaim and Novoselev, these are the two, uh, Andre Gaim and uh, Austin Novoselev. Gaim was a professor, Novoselev was a postdoc in their group, and they were responsible for isolating Griff, single sheets of Griffin. And an important uh, uh, result from their first uh, paper on uh, Griffey uh, was that they also were able to show, like I mentioned earlier, that they were able to do controlled experiments, transport experiments on Griffin, and they were able to show a very important result that there's a field effect uh, in Griffin. What that means is that by applying a gate voltage to a Griffin sheet, uh, you can have electron transport in one region when you apply a positive gate voltage and you can have a have a have whole transport in the negative gate voltage range. So uh, in one system you are having electron and whole transport uh, by applying appropriate gate voltages. So that was a very important result and uh, and, and uh, we will discuss its significance uh, later also. Another thing that they were brought to light was that uh, the experiments that they performed were quantum hall type experiments. And in my third lecture, I am going to discuss. Uh, oh, sorry, let me just address this. In my uh, third lecture, I am going to discuss uh, these quantum hall uh, measurements. But the kind of experiments that they did at that time, just to uh, inform you was that they had this uh, graphene sheet on a, uh, on a uh, silicon dioxide substrate and uh, this, this configuration is a typical hall type measurement where you have these uh, probes for hall voltages and this longitudinal voltage probes and, uh, and, a, and a metal gate uh, and you can apply a gate voltage to a metal gate and tune the uh, number density uh, in graphene. So gate voltage controls charge on graphene. You can think of this as a capacitor and the charge uh, on the graphene sheet can be tuned uh, by applying the gate voltage that essentially uh, changes the number density on the graphene sheet and in turn the charge uh, on the graphene sheet. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, another important fact is that the system has anti bipolar and bipolar conduction. What that means is that electrons and holes both contribute to conduction depending on what uh, gate voltage you apply to the system. And this, these are the micrographs where these hall probes uh, are attached and these are the graphene crystallites that they obtained and uh, did their experiments on. After isolation of graphene, uh, they had to prove that these, uh, and then they uh, sort of studied their, uh, uh, and uh, let me just put it this way, that they had to do a few experiments like uh, quantum hall measurements and cyclotron mass measurement, where they were able to show that these uh, Dirac fermions really are massless. And uh, uh, for, for a massless Dirac fermion, uh, 
can be shown that the cyclotron mass goes a square root of n, number density. And this is what they found when they did the cyclotron mass measurements on Griffith. Again, uh, this was uh, another proof, yet another proof, that uh, the dark fermions are massless and they obey and the massless rack weight. As far as the electronic properties are concerned, uh, as we met, uh, discussed earlier, that these uh, uh, convection and valence bands, they touch at these Dirac points. Out of these uh, Dirac points, only two are in equivalent. So we are essentially going to concentrate, uh, whenever we, are, we study these uh, low energy properties, we are going to only concentrate on two Dirac points, K and K prime. And we will take, uh, for these low energy properties, that the dispersion relation for the Dirac uh, for neons, it is linear. So the so Dirac electrons uh, or or the graphene electrons they mimic Dirac particles or Dirac electrons at points K and K prime. Dirac pseudo spin corresponds to the sublattice A and B. I'll have more to say on that. Yes. So we have Fermi velocity in place of light speed, and the chiral dynamics is important also. Like I said in the first lecture, mentioned in the first lecture. <coughs> Chirality is an important property here, and uh, what that signifies, uh, uh, we also talk about that. Essentially, what when we talk about the chirality operator, we are talking about sigma dot p. So, what we are saying that for Dirac fermions, it's uh, spin and momentum are coupled. The linear momentum and spin are coupled. So. Uh, in our analysis, we did not include 
this film. So you remember the type ending that they should be, I mean, even if you, uh, uh, in a continuum approximation, if you derive the uh, Dirac two-dimensional Dirac region relevant to graphene, uh, you don't include spin. Yes. Uh, and, uh, what, but you still get uh, a sigma matrix appearing in the Hamiltonian. And in the, the Dirac region, what, what that uh, basically signifies is that uh, it is a sub-lattice lattice index and not the real spin. So if you want to include the real spin, you have to by hand put in the real spin. So psi A over here, for example, is is the is a wave function of the electrons localized on the A lattice, but not taking into account the spin of the electron. Not taking into account exactly. So it is a probability amplitude for the electron to be on uh, site A or atom A, and this is the amplitude to be on B, but taking not taking into account spin. So it is all a, without spin. Then, this will become a four-component object. Uh, if you take it into spin, it will become four-component. And if you take it into account the two values, it will also become four-component object without spin. But then it would be the other spin component sublattice index is going to come from the other value. So you can have that four-component uh, spinner if you include the two values, or if you include spin. When you say two values uh, on the dispersion. Version relation. Where can I see those values? Because multi-value. Where do I see the second value? I mean, there's no first. Yeah, go on. I mean, that, uh, we derived it for single value. We're trying to obtain equivalent. Oh, right. Equivalent. Equivalent. Yeah. Because there are two inequivalent yeah. Dirac points. Right. Uh, in, inequivalent in the sense that uh, all the rest of the Dirac points uh, are related to these Dirac points through the reciprocal lattice. So they are equivalent to these. So at this stage, I think uh, we should also, I mean, I, I should also uh, discuss why we are interested in graphene. First, I'll talk about applications. And it also I mean, sort of uh, gives you an idea of why there's so much excitement about graphene, and, and especially from an applications point of view. And then I'll come to fundamental physics aspects. One of the important points is that it has uh, exceptional electron quality, that uh, with very few defects, you can have crystal lights of uh, an of order of 100 microns and even larger. The mobilities are very high. And these are the highest of any known uh, material. The only comparable in the system is the 2 deck. Yes. Still, it hasn't still reached that uh, 2 deck. But not at these temperatures. Not at these temperatures, exactly. Uh, the crystal quality, very commensurate of few defects, very high thermal conductivity. Uh, you have ballistic transport on some micron scale. So you have almost uh, uh, transport without any any scattering on, on, on uh, micron scales, almost micron scales under any conditions. So all of these, from a applications point of view, are very uh, important, uh, for, especially for people who are working in device physics. So it really excites them to know that graphene has all of these uh, very special features. And uh, from a fundamental physics point of view, if we are not doing device physics, uh, from fundamental physics point of view, there's also a lot of excitement because the quasi-particles in the system are chiral, massless, dark for me uh, Not really observed in other condensed matter systems, but recently there have been some examples of systems where, are, where these are dark fermions are observed, like in topological insulators. And, uh, and even in some uh, organic uh, systems also, and some other systems. Uh, and then there are uh, uh, reactivistic eff effects. What that means is that uh, uh, there was a lot of excitement in the sense to see what, I mean, we've learned a lot from relativistic quantum mechanics, and now we are uh, we are seeing that uh, in a condensed matter system, which is a non-relativistic system, we are uh, uh, these particles behave as relativistic particles. So, a lot of those relativistic effects, uh, they show up here, and that creates a lot of excitement to see uh, how similar they are, how different they are, what are, what, what are the consequences of that. And then, in addition to that, uh, another very interesting aspect is that uh, uh, certain phenomena which were observed in uh, uh, condensed matter systems other than graphene appear as, as different or 
for example, the anomalous, like uh, the quantum Hall effect is not exactly the same quantum Hall effect that we observe in, in two deck systems. So that is also very interesting. Uh, so all of these and, and uh, are uh, very uh, important as far as... Uh, so now we're going to look at the consequences uh, of some of these interesting fundamental properties uh, to transport. And uh, now what I'm saying here, uh, what, you, what I show here on this slide, is uh, the role of chirality. To understand the role of chirality, we must understand that uh, on these Dirac, Dirac, uh, Dirac cones, what, what, are, what we have is uh, the K value. I mean, for the whole, you would have another symmetrical uh, cone. On the K value, the electrons have a positive helicity or chirality. That means uh, the momentum and the pseudo spin are aligned along the same direction. And if you go to the K prime valley, the helicity is opposite. So that means that uh, the electron momentum and the pseudo spin are aligned in the opposite direction. So uh, even this feature, chirality, has important consequences in transport. And chirality, uh, you must remember, is, uh, is what means here is that uh, the pseudo spin is tied to the momentum of the electrons. And uh, in the K valley, electrons have this positive chirality, whereas the holes have negative chirality. Electrons have negative chirality or helicity in, uh, on the K prime valley, whereas the holes have positive. And so what, what are the consequences of it? Let's look at one of those consequences. Uh, uh, soon after the uh, uh, soon after Dirac gave his uh, relativistic equation, Klein applied that equation to the well-known problem of electron incident on the square band. I mean, that problem we are all familiar with from our quantum mechanics course. And uh, when he considered this transmission problem using uh, the Dirac equation, what he found was that uh, uh, then no matter how high the barrier is or how wide the barrier is, for the incident angle, which is, uh, if it is an incident normal to the barrier, there's complete transmission without any reflection, which is a very surprising result. And when I say how high the barrier is, I mean it's twice the rest mass identity of the electrons. So, uh, so that means if if you have, even if you have an extremely high barrier, an extremely wide barrier, you get complete transmission and there is no back spectrum, which is unlike what we observe uh, in, in non relativistic quantum mechanics because as you remember from your course, transmission probability decays exponentially with distance and higher the barrier. So this was uh, at that time quite a, a, a new thing in the sense that it was surprising itself and it was called Klein Paradox. And when, uh, so Klein Paradox is transmission of electricity particles is unimpeded, given by an effect. So, uh, so that result was explained by, uh, sort of this paradox was sort of explained that there are negative energy states within the barrier. So those negative energy states align with the positive energy states outside the barrier and, and a, an electron transports as a positron to the barrier and reveal this electron beyond the barrier. I mean, that, that was the sort of, of way to explain this uh, this result. And so, when uh, when Griffin was isolated, uh, Kasnetsen, Novoselov, and Gaim, they looked at the same problem and they said, okay, uh, uh, for time paradox to be in a relativistic setting would require a field of 10 to the 16 volt per centimeter. That is unachievable. So perhaps because these particles are massless dark fermions, so perhaps much lower magnetic or electric fields will be required to create a barrier where time tunneling can be observed. So they looked at the same problem, and uh, but they used the, the Dirac spinners for for Griffin, and and uh, the, used the standard incident. They, they considered this kind of a barrier, where this is the incident Dirac fermion. And uh, they wrote down the incident wave function in terms of the Dirac spinner that we talked about later. And, uh, 
and uh, and uh, uh, this side one component and this side two component. This is x less than zero, which is on this side of the barrier, within the barrier, and beyond the barrier. And the the standard way to approach this kind of a problem is to match the wave functions, and you can determine the transmission probability. And the result that they found uh, in the limit of uh, for high barrier was was this analytical result t is equal to this quantity where phi is the incident angle. And what they found was, if you plot this result, is that uh, when the incident uh, angle uh, is zero, that means it's normal, normal incident on the barrier, there's perfect transmission without any back scattering. And uh, they interpreted this result by saying that it is due to conservation of pseudospin. What that means is that on this side of the barrier, uh, electrons, this, is, this energy is the Fermi energy of the electrons. And so the incident electrons appear here. Because of this potential, this Dirac chron is shifted up. So you have these, uh, this, this, the Fermi energy in the valence band. And so the, the electron states uh, align with the hole. So it basically is in condensed matter physics not difficult to explain because it's like interband tunneling. Electron uh, tunnels uh, from the conduction band goes to the valence band and tunnels through. And they explained it on the basis of also conservation of pseudospin in the sense that uh, to an electron on this, if, ele if you consider this electron, it has pseudospin pointing in this direction. To backscatter, it would require the pseudospin to flip. So it would, but to go as a hole inside this, inside the barrier, the pseudospin is still pointing in the same direction. Because this is the negative branch of the Dirac cone and for the for the, the holes the moment negative uh, the pseudo spin points opposite to the momentum so this negative momentum momentum for the holes is in this direction and pseudo spin has to point in this direction so pseudo spin on on this red line pseudo spin points in the same direction so pointing if the words so called pointing inwards point, pointing inwards yeah, pointing to the right so on this pseudo spin is pointing to the right so if has to backscatter, then that means the pseudospin has to flip, so it has to go on that side. But uh, if you interpret this result as due to conservation of pseudospin, uh, you can explain uh, this absence of backscattering. So this, uh, they explain this all as, as uh, conservation of pseudospin because pseudospin can only be flipped if there is a potential. Uh, short range potential which affects the uh, sublattice A and B differently. Only then it would uh, cause the pseudospin to flip because pseudospin relates to uh, sub sublattice in this. So that was a, uh, an important uh, paper where they showed this as well. Another uh, transport problem where uh, it became clear that perfect transmission occurs was more relevant to device physics where uh, it was considered that there's a put, that you could have an NP junction very easily in graphene because by applying gates, as you know, you can tune the charge carriers from electrons to holes. So if you have different voltages on the gates, you can have NP region. And that this kind of problem can also be treated as a barrier problem with electrons, with, with some kind of a potential barrier step. If it's, it is smooth, uh, Falco and these people calculated this result and they again showed that there is perfect transmission in the forward direction and again a manifestation of, uh, of chiral dynamics in the sense that yes, conservation of pseudospin or, and so forth. Another problem where uh, transport problem where the chirality has an uh, important role to play uh, is uh, strain out when chirality what this means is that uh, we're going to look at a certain transport problem uh, where, uh, and this transport problem uh, is important in the sense that uh, this kind of a situation appears when the temperature is very low because electrons wave properties are uh, important in this kind of an, uh, application. So at low temperature, wave like nature of charge carriers become detectable through quantum interference spectrum. Now what I'm talking about is is, is a mesoscopic regime. So 
Myoscopic regime, uh, to understand myoscopic regime, we have to define certain characteristic lengths. One important length for electrons, like I said earlier, so quantum mechanical effects, uh, as far as electrons are concerned, one of the important consequences is that they have wave-like behavior. So well, one can talk about the de Broglie wave, and it's related obviously to the momentum of the kinetic energy of the electrons. Then there's another important length scale, which is the mean free path. This is the distance the electron travels before its initial momentum is destroyed. And the third important length scale is uh, the phase in the relaxation. And uh, this is important in the, con uh, in the context of if you're seeing, if you want to observe interference type phenomena for electron transport problems, then the, the electron wave has to be phase coherent. And phase coherent to occur will depend on how far an electron can travel before its initial. And uh, as uh, you probably know, but I let I'll sort of uh, reiterate that uh, uh, a phase scattering type uh, uh, phenomena can occur, or a phase uh, can be destroyed if there's some inelastic scattering. For example, if electron interacts with a phonon, or with some kind of an impurity which is moving, then in that kind of a situation there will be elastic scattering and the phase of the electron wave will be destroyed. On the other hand, if you have elastic scattering, the phase uh, information is intact. And, but these length scales, as I say, depends on the, on the material and the temperature. So if the dimensions of a conductor are larger than these length scales, then we see the classical opening type behavior. But if uh, the length scale becomes smaller than, for example, the phase coherence length, coherence length then you would observe uh, it's a famous type phenomena, the typical quantum mechanical phenomena will be occur. Otherwise, it will be washed out. And uh, that brings us to uh, weak localization phenomena. Uh, in uh, various thin films, metallic thin films, for example, this kind of phenomenon was observed. And what, what that has to do with is that the hematonium has to be invariant under time universal. Why is that important? And we have to consider paths which start and finish at one point. So classically, the return probability, and what we are interested in, is calculating the return probability. Why is that important? Because what we are interested in is the localization effect. And localization here is being defined in terms of the return probability. That is, there the return, is the return probability finite or zero? If it is zero, there is no localization because Initially, if you have an electron at one point, it will propagate further and further away. And the probability of coming back to the same point will be very small. But in some instances, that return probability is very significant, and that can be interpreted as a localization phenomena. Or in other words, that the conductivity of the sample decreases. And here, uh, you will find that classical and quantum effects, I mean, you can uh, distinguish classical and quantum effects very clearly. So, classically return probability is the sum of the probabilities of propagating along each path separately, whereas quantum mechanically we have to sum the amplitudes. And interference effects arise because of that. So, for weak localization, what we are saying is that uh, for an electron to propagate from point 1 to point 2 in a, in a certain time, and uh, we're defining the transition amplitudes along different parts by this quantity here. Uh, I'm suppressing all the, all the uh, dependencies of position and time, for example. Um, so, you have to, you have, if you, this, this is the classical probability, and these are the interference contributions. So, if you sum the probability amplitudes and square them, this term here corresponds to the classical result, and this is purely quantum mechanical interference contribution. But what happens is that for most paths, these because all of these different paths have random phases, and these these cancel out. So you, you essentially get the classical result. But in one very special case, it doesn't happen, and where it doesn't happen leads to weak localization. And that special case is if you consider paths. Which 
loop back to the starting point. So in that case, if you consider this path going like this, so electron propagating, scattering from different sides and coming back, and electron propagating in the opposite direction and coming back to the same point, starting point. These two amplitudes are time reversed of each other. That means one can be expressed as a complex conjugate of the other. So when you do that and sum these amplitudes up and square them to find the probability, what you find is a factor of four multiplying it. In the classical reserve, what you would have here is a two. So what that means is that the backscattering probability is enhanced by a factor of two. And this is what is called weak localization. And uh, time reversal of uh, that the Hamiltonian should be time reversed is important because uh, you find that if you apply a, weak, apply a magnetic field, it destroys time reversal invariance. Uh, in that case, weak localization is destroyed because that also adds a phase factor uh, randomly to the uh, to these paths, and that can and actually that is the way uh, it is uh, checked whether weak localization is occurring or not. So we, we say there is a reduction uh, in the conductivity uh, due to enhanced back spectrum is what is known as weak localization. Like I said earlier, if you have a magnetic field, uh, what it does is add this phase factor to the amplitudes and, you have, and if you do the same analysis, what you find is this, this interference type term and which are for different rooms it leads to zero, so this uh, weak localization is destroyed by the magnetic field, and this is how it is observed in this parameters. So now the same phenomena we want to see, look at. This was observed uh, several years ago in various uh, semiconductor uh, thin films and metallic thin films, and uh, now the same thing we want to see. How is it different in graphene? What we find in graphene is that instead of localization, you have uh, anti-localization because of the chiral nature. Because uh, backscattering is absent in graphene and leads to weak anti-localization. What this means here is, uh, to be specific, let's consider, uh, if you don't consider any valley coupling, and let's consider that there is a there is some potential neutral impurity of this form. And we calculate the matrix elements. What, where psi plus is, is uh, one of the spinners. And this is k, and initial uh, wave number is k, or wave vector is k, and the final wave vector is k prime. And this is for a for, for single value. And when you calculate this uh, matrix element for this potential, this is an example. What you find is, a, is that what you find is that uh, the matrix element has this uh, dependence on on the angles theta k minus theta k prime. And uh, what this shows is that the scattering amplitude for backscattering is because for backscattering the theta has to change by by the angle. But uh, things are more complicated in graphene because if you have uh, the situation where you allow for belly mixing, that means if you take the, you see, you remember that uh, the spinners, the spinners were psi plus and psi minus. So there was one which corresponded to electrons and one corresponded to holes for each k value. k prime value had the same so, uh, for, for holes and electrons. So uh, in the, if you have these spinners states, for two different values, if you couple two different values, this, this is what I'm calling very mixing. So this, you have this psi plus k, and you have psi plus k prime, but this corresponds k prime. Uh, uh, this corresponds to the other value. Don't confuse the k prime and k. These are the wave vectors, get initial and final wave vectors. But these, uh, if you use the spinners from two different values, what you find is that that scattering is permitted because. You see this. Uh, this is what you get for the for the matrix element, and this 
case, that statin is allowed. So whether uh, it is localization or anti-localization would depend on whether value mixing is a, is, can happen or not. And uh, uh, value mixing or not also depends on the kind of uh, disorder in the system. Whether there is a short range disorder or long range disorder. So if there is long range on the scale of the that is spacing, if it is long range, then that basically means that you can you can treat the values separately. But if it is short range, then you have to allow for value mixing. In that case, uh, uh, weak anti-localization uh, effects would not occur. So that this example was to highlight that in graphene, the normal transport properties like localization properties uh, are more complicated, more complex. Let's end the second lecture. <laughs>
and on the third day we will also provide certificates to the participants who uh, attend uh, all three days of the lectures. So we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 10 a.m. and once again we would like to thank both speakers.